Well, the red blood cells are called the erythrocytes. Erythro means red. If someone was erythromatose, they would be a red colour. And there's about 5 million red blood cells per cubic millimetre of the blood. So the blood's absolutely full of them. In fact, this is why blood is red. Blood is red because it contains red blood cells. And the red blood cells are red because they contain an oxygen-carrying pigment called haemoglobin. That's why the blood is red. That's why tissues are pink, because they're perfused with red blood as the red cells circulate through the superficial capillaries. And the red blood cells are produced in the red bone marrow. Now, the red bone marrow is in cavities inside bones. And the red bone marrow is found in flat bones like the ribs or the skull or the pelvic bones or the sternum. And it's also found at the end of long bones, such as the end of the femur or the end of the humerus. Now, in the bone marrow, there are specialist cells which are called stem cells. And a stem cell is a cell which is capable of dividing to produce new cells or other types of cells. So the stem cells, if you like, are kind of master cells. And these stem cells divide and give rise to populations of other blood cells, some of which are these red blood cells. And the red cells themselves, the erythrocytes, are actually biconcave discs. So that means when you look at them, they're darker on the outside and lighter on the inside. And they're about 7 micrometres in diameter. So that means they can fit through small capillaries. Although actually some capillaries are so small, particularly the capillaries in the brain or the kidneys, are so small that the red cells actually have to squeeze to fit through them. So red cells are actually quite flexible. They can squeeze down through narrow capillaries as they circulate around the blood vessels. And sometimes you can see your own red blood cells. If you look into a bright sky and just let your focus drift, not look at anything in particular, you can sometimes see what's called little red cell ghosts drifting in front of your eyes. And you can actually see that they're biconcave discs. You can see they've got a rim on the outside and another bit on the inside. You can't see the colour, they just look fairly transparent. But that's actually the red cells floating through your retina. And your retina is so sensitive that under these circumstances, you can actually see the red cells circulating in front of your very own eyes. So, as we've said, the main function of the red cells is to transport oxygen around the body. And in the lungs, the haemoglobin in the red cells combines with oxygen and it forms oxyhemoglobin. And the key thing about oxyhemoglobin is it carries the oxygen, but also it's bright red. That's what makes arterial blood bright red. So if you cut an artery, bright red blood will spurt out of that. And sometimes you can see bright red blood within a wound, meaning there's some arterial component to the haemorrhage. And in the tissues, the oxyhemoglobin splits into haemoglobin and oxygen. That means the oxyhemoglobin gives up the oxygen it was carrying. Then it goes back to the lungs in a more deoxygenated form, sometimes called deoxyhemoglobin. And the red blood cells carry nearly all of the oxygen which is transported in the blood. There's a little bit of oxygen transported as it dissolves in the plasma, but about 98.5% of the total amount of oxygen carried in the blood is carried by the haemoglobin molecules in the red cells. And actually on the return journey, about 23% of the carbon dioxide is also carried by the red cells. So as well as carrying oxygen to the tissues, the red cells are carrying some carbon dioxide from the tissues back to the lungs where it can be breathed out. So we can see that these red blood cells are fairly important, absolutely crucial to life actually. Now, it's important to have the right amount of red cells in the blood at any one time. If there's too many red cells, the blood becomes thick and is more likely to clot. And if a blood clot forms inside a vessel, we call that a thrombus. The disease process is called thrombosis. And that is obviously a very dangerous condition. In fact, it's a life-threatening condition in many circumstances. So we don't want the blood to be too thick because we want to avoid the possibility of thrombus formation. But there again, 
we need enough red blood cells of sufficient quality in the blood to transport the oxygen. If there's not enough red cells transporting oxygen around the body, we would call that anemia. There's going to be a reduced oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. So we need to avoid polycythemia, too many red cells. We need to avoid anemia, not enough red cells. The number of red cells in the plasma, floating in the plasma in the blood, needs to be homeostatically regulated. And it's a bit complicated actually, because red cells are the only cell in the body which does not contain a nucleus. They do not have their own living DNA. They did when they were in the bone marrow, but it's not preserved when they're in the circulation. And this means that the red cells can't repair themselves effectively. And this means they have a limited lifespan. So red blood cells only live for about 17 weeks. And after that 17 weeks, they start to deteriorate and they're actually taken out by macrophages in the spleen mostly and to some extent in the liver by the monocyte macrophage system, which are phagocytoses, old red blood cells. So given that there's ongoing destruction of old red blood cells, it therefore follows that new red blood cells need to be generated, produced at the same rate to balance the loss. So the number of new cells going into the circulatory system needs to be the same as the number of old cells leaving the circulatory system. So how is this done? Well, the answer is it's actually regulated by an endocrine hormone. Now, if I were to ask you, whereabouts in the body are the levels of oxygen in the blood detected? So there's a certain amount of oxygen in the blood at any one period of time, any one instance in time. Where in the body is that detected? Well, one of the answers to that question is the kidneys. It's the kidneys that detect the level of oxygen in the blood. Now, I know there are chemoreceptors in other parts of the body as well, but the kidneys are constantly detecting the amount of oxygen in the blood which is circulating through the kidneys. Now, if the amount of oxygen in the blood going through the kidney drops, the kidney will respond by increasing the amount of a hormone it releases. And that hormone is called EPO or erythropoietin. So when there's less oxygen in the blood going to the kidneys, the kidneys respond by producing more erythropoietin. This erythropoietin circulates in the blood and it goes to the red bone marrow. In the red bone marrow, the erythropoietin stimulates the production of more red blood cells. And that process, the production of red blood cells, is called erythropoiesis. So when the amount of oxygen going to the kidney drops, the amount of erythropoietin secreted by the kidney increases. That stimulates the process of erythropoiesis in the red bone marrow and that's going to increase the number of red cells which are released into the circulatory system. Now, if you've got more red blood cells in the circulatory system, that's going to increase the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. So because there's more red blood cells, more oxygen can be carried in the blood. And that means that the blood going to the kidneys is going to contain more oxygen. And the kidneys are going to detect that they're going to detect the increase in the amount of oxygen in the blood, which is perfusing through the kidney itself. And when the kidneys detect an increased amount of oxygen in the blood, they will decrease the amount of erythropoietin that they release. So more oxygen going through the kidneys, less erythropoietin is produced. This means there's less erythropoietin circulating in the blood, Therefore, there's less erythropoietin circulating through the bone marrow. Therefore, there is less stimulation of erythropoiesis. That means there is less formation of red blood cells and not as many red blood cells will be formed that day. But if this goes on for a period of time, then the number of red blood cells in the blood will start to drop. That will reduce the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. The reduced amounts of oxygen in the blood will be detected by the kidneys. 
and the kidneys will respond by producing more erythropoietin. That erythropoietin will circulate to the bone marrow, it will stimulate the production of more red blood cells, it will stimulate the process of erythropoiesis, increasing the number of red cells, thereby increasing the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, and of course that's going to be detected by the kidneys. So this is an ongoing process where the amount of oxygen in the blood is constantly being detected and the number of red blood cells which are produced are titrated to meet the oxygen requirements of the kidney essentially. So what it means is there's ongoing homeostatic regulation of the number of red blood cells in the blood at any one time. And this prevents us from becoming polycythemic with too many and it prevents us from becoming anemic with not enough. Now if you go and live at altitude up a mountain then the partial pressure of oxygen in the air will drop and that's going to reduce the amount of oxygen in the blood despite the fact that the number of red cells that you have in your circulation is just the same as you had when you were at sea level. But nevertheless this means that there will be less total amount of oxygen being transported by your red blood cells and this will be detected by the kidneys and the kidneys will produce erythropoietin and this will stimulate erythropoiesis. So when you go and live at altitude over the course of a few weeks there's going to be an increase in the number of red cells in the circulation increasing the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood allowing you to be more functional at altitude. And it's the same if someone exercises a lot. If you exercise you're using up the oxygen that means there's less oxygen left in the blood. That's detected by the kidneys and the kidneys will produce more erythropoietin. That's why someone who exercises regularly will probably have more red blood cells in their circulation than someone who doesn't exercise. And that will make them fitter because it will increase the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. So these are normal physiological adaptations, tweaking if you like of the homeostatic mechanism to allow us to cope with different levels of exercise requirement and to live at different altitudes. But we can get the same situation if someone's got a chronic lung disease. If someone's got a chronic lung disease, the lungs are not oxygenating the blood effectively. There's going to be less oxygen in the blood as a result of the chronic lung disease, such as chronic bronchitis. That's going to be detected by the kidney and there's going to be more red blood cells produced through the erythropoietin erythropoiesis mechanism. So people who have chronic lung diseases might have chronically increased levels of red blood cells. People that smoke are also able to carry less oxygen in their blood. This is because the carbon monoxide from the cigarette smoke can combine with the haemoglobin and form a compound called carboxyhemoglobin which doesn't carry oxygen. So that means that even although smokers have got normal amounts of red blood cells, those red blood cells are carrying less oxygen. And again, this is detected by the kidney and the kidney will try and compensate by producing more red blood cells. Now the opposite can happen in renal failure. Some patients who've got chronic renal failure actually lose the cells that produce the erythropoietin in the kidney. Now the erythropoietin is normally made by specialized fibroblast type cells in the kidney and in chronic renal failure as well as the other kidney cells dying the erythropoietin cells will also progressively die off meaning that patients with chronic renal failure often can't produce enough erythropoietin and this means that the red bone marrow is not stimulated they can't make the red cells and they become anemic now when I was a student we used to give people with chronic renal failure blood transfusions to try and compensate for this anemia but now we can give them injections of EPO, erythropoietin because it's now available in synthetic form and actually this has been used by athletes who cheat sometimes they inject themselves with EPO to make more red blood cells to increase the oxygen carrying capacity of their blood but of course it's cheating and it's also very dangerous because it makes them more likely to get blood clots. So the amount of red blood cells in the blood is homeostatically regulated and this is all going on all the time 
without us being aware of it. And the only time we become aware of it is if the mechanism goes wrong in a pathological situation. But physiologically, we've got this fine control going on all the time. Not too much, not too little. It's a homeostatic regulatory mechanism. Regulatory mechanism. Regulatory.